This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello, and welcome to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist. I live in Fayetteville, Arkansas. I've been here almost 27 years and have practiced here the whole time. I started this podcast to extend the walls of my practice to those of you who might already be very interested in therapeutic, emotional ideas, maybe in therapy, to those of you who may have just been diagnosed with something that you're looking for answers to, or perhaps you're having a relationship problem that you can't quite mend, but also to a third group of you that have let the stigma of mental illness treatment prevent you from ever reaching out or maybe just some assumptions you've made about the mental health profession. So I'm here to help you challenge those as you listen in on what at least this therapist has to say. Today I was motivated by a response to one of my Instagram postings this week. I'm doing a series called What I've Learned as a Therapist. actually did it last year as well. And I heard from so many people that I decided to do it again. And we'll post 100 days in a row. Keep my fingers crossed. By the time this airs, I think I'll be on day 19, but you can see them all if you're interested. Anyway, someone put such an inspiring response to the post that I was blown away. The post itself talked about familiar pain versus unfamiliar pain, and that we often choose familiar pain simply because it's familiar. Risking unfamiliar pain is something I focus on with almost every client I see, because we all get in the habit of adopting one emotional face or have one emotion that's our primary go-to response to almost anything. Some of those responses are more healthy than others, but the point of this episode will be to wonder what would happen if you risk feeling something you don't ordinarily feel. It can be transformative, actually, and it also takes vulnerability and courage We'll talk about getting caught in certain familiar roles of the victim, the savior, and the persecutor, better known as the Cartman Triangle. And I'll use what I hope is a helpful metaphor to demonstrate what I mean, as I always think we remember pictures or stories better than words. So, we'll talk today on this episode of Self Work. I can't believe it's number 188, and it's sponsored once again by BetterHelp. We'll talk about risking feeling unfamiliar emotions. The listener email for today is from a young woman who in the last six months has experienced unbelievable trials and now is suffering from a desire to be invisible and alone. I'll do my best to help her understand that what she's experiencing is trauma and a reaction to it. So sit back and relax and let's talk about unfamiliar pain. As I said in the intro, I'm doing a series again on Instagram entitled, What I've Learned as a Therapist. I had such fun and got to know lots of people that I decided to repeat it. Last week, I'd posted about familiar versus unfamiliar emotions or discomfort or pain. Here are the words of my Instagram post. Many of us have a feeling that we are most comfortable in expressing. Sometimes that feeling is optimism or even rigid positivity, if taken too far. For some, it's the opposite, and being distrustful or more negative has become your go-to emotion. Whatever the emotion that you choose, what happens if you risk connecting with its seeming opposite? If you always smile, although pain is there, what would it feel like to risk feeling anger or sadness? If you're always angry... How long has it been since you risked joy or feeling content? Feeling the unfamiliar takes courage, no matter in which direction you choose to go. What I wanted to explain was that people can likely be just as stuck in positivity or what might be considered good emotions that keep them from risking feeling others, such as imperfectly hidden depression, which I've talked about a lot, or they can have a pattern of more negativity and not risk what it might be like to not have that be their response to everything. This problem can arise from someone's emotional or even mental responses being too skewed in one direction or another. It wasn't long after I posted this graphic when I received a comment in return, and I was blown away by its clarity and vulnerability. She first said that my post was very validating. Of course, that's very nice. But here are her words. 
Strong, stressful emotions felt as familiar as home to me. It got to where I felt if I wasn't stressing and anxious that I was missing something. That's quote unquote. It's taken me all the way into my 30s to realize I've been doing this for years and years. Better late than never, I suppose, but it still makes me sad that I missed out on so many things because I was isolating and freaking out alone. Even though it's horrible and painful to be so tense all the time, I always felt like it was normal, and letting go of that feeling felt even worse. It made me feel like letting my guard down would put me in danger. Who knew stopping stressing could be more scary than something stressful? And then she says, I love your podcast, Dr. Rutherford. Please keep it up if you can. That's very nice. And I'm featuring your post, which I said I would. She very aptly points out that many times stopping doing what's familiar, what's comfortable, what you're used to feeling or doing, whether or not it's constructive or destructive to you, can be very uncomfortable, if not damn terrifying. Like someone who never allows themselves to be angry might actually stand up for themselves. They find their voice, if only for a moment. Or let's take someone who wears a shield of aloofness around them, and they hold a child's hand, and that allows tenderness to emerge. These may sound like movie moments, something you'd see in a Disney flick. Times when on the big screen we see someone's gruff exterior loosen, or stand up and cheer when someone who's been bullied finally says her piece. But the process is what therapy often focuses on. What are you doing or saying or feeling out of habit, and how can you live more clearly in the present and rummage around in lots of different emotional or even mental reactions and responses? I'm not going to do a whole episode on what's called the Karpman Triangle. That's K-A-R-P-M-A-N, and I'll have a link to some articles in the show notes if you're interested. But the Cartman Triangle is a very interesting theory that says that people who've had trauma in their lives are often stuck in their response set. That means how they typically respond to all kinds of situations. That's your response set. And they're stuck in between three roles, the victim, the savior, and the persecutor. In this well-written Forbes article, again, the link in the show notes, the author explains, the victim sees life as happening to them and feels powerless to change their circumstances. Victims place blame on a persecutor who can be a person or a situation. Being powerless, the victim ostensibly seeks a rescuer to solve the problem for them. Victims also have a sneaky interest in validating their problem as being unsolvable. That's interesting. He also points out that the savior or rescuer doesn't simply want to help the victim. Rather, their goal is to be seen as doing something special or good, which may actually only enable the victim to remain just that, a victim. Let's take this one conversation to see if you can hear this. Let's say Jane comes home to find her partner, John, yelling at their kid. Let's call their kid Jeff. By the way, in grad school, we learned that it was a sign of concern when we met a family or worked with a family that had named all their kids with the same first initial. (laughs) I don't know if that stands up, but it's always interesting to me. So Jane says, John, stop yelling at Jeff. She's the persecutor. It's okay, baby. Rescuer. John, well, if you'd come home earlier, I would have had some time to myself, both persecutor and victim. Jane, I couldn't come home because I was knee-deep in emails I missed when you were sick last week, and I had to keep Jeff. Victim. John, well, excuse me of getting sick. Victim and persecutor. Jane, I didn't mean that. I know you're really sick, and I took great care of you, by the way. Savior, I won't go on. You can see that it's a battle for the spot that seems to offer the most power. In a more healthy relationship, Jane would have walked in and said, Whoa, John, let me take over for a minute and try to understand what's going on. And he might have said, Thanks. Sorry, Jeff. Daddy didn't mean to yell. Sometimes when I see you do something dangerous, I yell before I help you because I get scared. And you can see how that would go much better. We all may tend to do this savior, victim, persecutor thing a little bit, but people who have experienced trauma can do it without even knowing it, and it's a very helpful awareness for them to have. It's interesting to analyze your own conversations, of course, and see how often you and your partner jump from role to role. Let's tie this back in into leaning into unfamiliar territory and thus the potential for feeling unfamiliar pain. 
Because even though you don't like feeling or presenting a certain way, maybe you don't, to use the Cartman Triangle, hate being a persecutor or hate being a victim or sometimes even hate being a savior, you can still get stuck there. For example, maybe you're always angry or always comparing yourself to others and take a one-down position. Those are the kind of habits we get into. Now let's move on to that metaphor I mentioned in the intro that I hope will be helpful. But before we do that, let's hear an offer from the sponsor of Self Work, BetterHelp. And by the way, it's a great offer. I was delighted when BetterHelp reached out to me as a potential sponsor. What exactly is BetterHelp? BetterHelp is an online therapy service that will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. It's not a crisis line. It's not really self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. I also tried this out, of course, for my self-work listeners, and I was very impressed with the two counselors I tried. There's a broad range of expertise, and you're actually matched to the therapist that they believe will work best for you. You can have video sessions, phone sessions. You can text. And actually, it's much less expensive than, quote-unquote, normal therapy. And BetterHelp is rated number one by so many platforms that specialize in trying to help you find the best therapy online for you. There's a special offer for self-work listeners where you get 10% off your first month at trybetterhelp.com slash self-work. That's trybetterhelp, that's H-E-L-P dot com slash self-work. You can begin getting help today, and I highly recommend it. So give it a try. Okay, let's hear about this metaphor I talked about in the intro. I think we all start off our lives being able to access a lot of emotions. We, we come out of the womb that way, and they become more complex as we age. Try thinking of all those emotions as drops of water or rain that fall on a mountainside. They begin traveling down the mountain, remember, each one of them a different feeling, and each bit of rain or water falls under its own steam. But hurdles get in the way. Sticks, stones, rocks, whatever. And the momentum of those feelings gets stopped. It becomes harder to even identify them. But what happens to the pressure of the rain and the momentum? The momentum takes those feelings, what are left of them, and keeps them traveling down the mountain. But the feeling behind the momentum, the initial emotion, has lost its initial identity. The farther down the mountain they go, the more they begin to meet in one stream. And that stream becomes the familiar response we have to situations. The more unfamiliar have gotten lost in their descent. I mean, think about when you look at a mountainside or even a hillside, you can see where the rain has hit the top of the mountain. And then gradually, the rain has dug tunnels or crevices where all the rain begins to go. And I think that's what happens with our feelings. We begin to be able to express them when we're children. They're very primitive, yes, but we still can express them all. But then as we get chided or ridiculed or we're told we're not to feel that way or are pushed and shoved around by life, then we turn into the one response that we feel most comfortable with. Our families can act as the obstructions. Our culture can as well. The rules that dictate what you're supposed to be or not be. Anything that would prevent you from freely and safely expressing who you are. Those things deny that feeling in existence. And whatever power it had gets absorbed by the rush of the rest of the water. So it ends. Emotionally, you become that stream, that gully. It's the one emotion that's known, maybe not liked, but known. So, as we always talk about on self-work, what can you do about it? First, you need to become aware of your own tried and true response. Do you always withdraw or get scared? Do you tend to voice negativity first? Are you always upbeat, not knowing how to tolerate the discomfort of emotional pain? Do you judge? Are you too trusting? Are you jealous? Whatever it is. There are hundreds of familiar responses. So be aware of what your most used response set is. Here are some examples. Before I ever hear what someone has to say, if they begin by saying, well, you may not like this, I automatically get defensive. Or here's another one. I know my brother-in-law is going to say something about my weight. He always does in a real subtle way, like, but you're such a pretty girl. 
And what do I do? I'm going to immediately want to walk out of the room. So you see, you get triggered by something and you have a response that's familiar. Withdrawal, anger, could be insecurity, could be so many things. So how do you change your response set? Let's talk about in the first, their set was to get defensive, to assume an angry posture. Instead, they could quickly respond with a laugh and say, well, this time I want to listen and hear you. I may even agree with you. Or you could say to your brother-in-law, thank you. It feels good to hear that you believe I'm attractive. Otherwise, I'm not into talking about my weight or my body. That you take a very positive, kind, but firm stance. If he says something else, maybe you do leave the room. (laughs) But still, you have given him the message that it's not okay to talk about that. Again, these are just two suggestions, but you can hear first the awareness of what they're used to doing and two, revamping their response in order to handle it differently and in a way that leans into change. Yes, it's unfamiliar. No, it won't always go well. Why? Because often the other person is so accustomed to you reacting the way you always do that they'll be surprised and may escalate even more. Like the brother-in-law will go, well, isn't she getting all fancy? or something like that. And then you have to be firm again or again to say, I'm not having this conversation, and then you leave the room. But perhaps they won't escalate, but it's pretty common. So it takes more than one change in your response set before others and you may get accustomed to your new normal. So the first step is to become aware of your automatic response set. Second, think about how you'd like to change that response set before you are facing those triggers. This can sometimes take the perspective or the help of a therapist or trusted friend because you can literally say, I don't know how else to feel. So you write out first your trigger, then your response set, and then how you'd like to change that response set. And now this is the important part, I think. The third step is you begin practicing. Try to tolerate the discomfort of even hearing yourself say the words when you're all alone. Remember, the unfamiliar feels far more risky. I do this in the car a lot. I'll be walking around and thinking, now, why do I always shrug off a compliment? Or why do I always get impatient in certain situations? Those of you who listen to self-work know that I struggle with patience. So, you know what? In the car, I'm driving around and I'll say, well, this is what I'd like to say. And I think about it, I give it some energy, and that's what you can do. But there's a fourth step. Write about what you're learning, how you're growing, and what direction is next. Once that current is running down the mountain more freely, so you can have greater access to all of your emotions and what all of them have to offer you. So again, the four steps. Think about your triggers and what your automatic response set is. Second, think about how you'd like to change that response set. Third, practice. Practice tolerating the discomfort. Feel how the words feel coming out of your mouth. And fourth, write about what you're learning, how you're growing, and what direction is next. Good luck. Our listener email today is from a young woman who has had such a traumatic hell of a 2020 And she doesn't even mention the pandemic. Her own life has been a tsunami of pain and change. Here are her own words. Hey, Dr. Rutherford. My name is Brianna, and I had a few questions for you. 2020 has been very hard for me. In January, I found out my husband had been cheating on me for more than half our marriage. And the time I found out, I just up and left him. Same day, took my kids and left. I'm living with my sister right now. Found a job. Then I got furloughed from that job. Found another job. I'm making below poverty income. Even with his child support payments, I'm struggling to figure out how to even be a single mom with two kids, one of which has autism. And I'm... I'm realizing that I'm starting to suffer from severe depression, but not in the regular sense, I guess, because I just want to be alone. I don't want to be near anybody. I've listened to some of your podcasts where people 
are worried that they are invisible, but for me, I want to be invisible. I don't want anybody to notice me. I just want to be alone. And my father passed away on Mother's Day, and I don't know if I'm processing this properly or not. As I stopped and tried to think about how to respond to Brianna, I looked for articles on wanting to disappear and its role with depression. What I found was this extremely poignant article by Courtney Inlow on this very topic, and I quote, As women, we feel compelled to make life work, family, social responsibilities, a career and still making room for self-care, a life too big and full and bursting at every seam, and it can be too much. But we just have to make it work, because we have to, because there is no alternative. As feminists, we know the idea of having it all isn't real or fair, but we still strive. And when it doesn't work, it feels like failure. That failure is bigger than just a self. It's a family, a marriage, a lifestyle, a gender. And how do you go on failing all of it? I don't know. That's why I long for disappearance, despite every cell screaming at me that I shouldn't feel this way. And the thing about this need, it sometimes magnifies and multiplies the worse I feel about it. It is a snake forever eating itself, growing larger and more oppressive. The harder I try to make it go away, the more I feed it. So I've learned to live with the snake. I thought this was incredible. Especially the last part where she says, the harder I try to make it go away, the more I feed it. The writer goes on to talk about how the acceptance of being depressed and knowing that your unique depression is about wishing you were invisible, that if you manage it rather than shaming yourself for it, that it can bring gifts. This is certainly the idea you've heard me talk about again with perfectly hidden depression, acceptance as being the key to courage and change. But let's also list the traumas that Brianna is trying to handle. There's been change on every front, painful breakup of marriage, a move, loss of job, poverty, single parenthood, death of her father, having a child with autism that needs services. Please recognize all of them as traumas, each and every one. Maybe you can ask your sister for a weekend off from being a mom. You can return the favor and see if you can find a way to get some time for yourself, write and feel and grieve. This may sound, however, too good to be true, and I certainly hear that money is tight. But you're emotionally getting wound up tighter and tighter yourself. And you can't disappear, which is what you know. But you can live with that desire to disappear and not shame yourself for wanting to. Certainly what is evident, Brianna, is that you're not scared to take the bull by the horns. You've left a husband that for half your marriage was unfaithful. You got furloughed from one job and found another. You're obviously a fighter. But everyone can get tired of being strong. Everyone. I've had people say to me, if one more person says, I don't know how you're handling this, I'm going to scream. I'm not handling it like the way they think I am. I'm just putting one foot in front of the other. So please don't shame yourself for wanting to disappear. An invisibility cloak would be nice, as it would be normal to feel as if bad stuff is really chasing you or even targeting you, and you need to find a hiding place. Second, try to see if there's a way to get a few hours to yourself to connect and to grieve. And third, learn how to manage the feeling of wanting to despair. Yet if it gets anywhere close to you hurting yourself, please immediately reach out for help. Things can get better. Thank you for honoring me by writing and take very good care. I hope this message is clear to all of you, that when life becomes overwhelming, it's probably because it is overwhelming, that anyone would be overwhelmed. You could ask for help. Sometimes asking for help takes more courage than fighting the battle yourself. All of you, if this is an issue for you, please be kind to yourself and lean into that sense of being overwhelmed. And again, if it gets too much, then go to your nearest emergency room or find someone in either the therapeutic or the medical profession to give you help. Thank you so much for being here at Self Work in this 188th episode. I appreciate the written reviews 
on Apple Podcast, about the podcast. We are growing by leaps and bounds, and I could not be happier with your help and participation. Thank you so very much. For those of you who have thought about buying Perfectly Hidden Depression but don't know if it's for you or not, I would hope that you would. I want to stress that the book is full of self-guided exercises to help you make that journey. You're not alone. And yet it also explains to you how dangerous perfectionism can actually be. I know it's hard to reach out when you're a perfectionist and when you're hiding. So maybe consider the ebook or the audiobook at first. And you can get Perfectly Hidden Depression on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, at your local bookstore, or you can order it from New Harbinger, the publisher themselves. Thank you also for any written review or rating that you leave at Amazon for that. You can reach me in lots of different ways. My email is askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. You can use the speak pipe feature, which is how Brianna got in touch with me. It's here in your show notes, but it's also on my website at drmargaretrutherford.com. And you can subscribe there, and you'll only get a weekly newsletter, but it includes my weekly blog post and my podcast. So it's a really easy way of keeping in touch. As I said before, I'm having some fun over on Instagram. Would love to have you there. That's Instagram.com slash Dr. Margaret Rutherford. And I have a Facebook closed group. We're about 2,300 members now. So we're very diverse, international, in fact, by a lot. And we welcome your presence as we give each other strength, empathy, laughter, and friendship. That's Facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. Again, Facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. Thank you again for being here. You have my gratitude. Take very good care. Stay safe and sane. This is Dr. Margaret, and you've been listening to Self-Work.